Dr. Lindsay Browning, welcome to the Freedom Pack podcast. Thank you for having me. So we're here today to discuss this book, Navigating Sleeplessness. The links for this will be in the show notes below. Um, for anyone who's clicked onto this video now or the podcast on Spotify or iTunes, they're probably looking to fix this. We've probably already got their attention. But for those who are in the first five minutes, they're unsure if this is for them. Before we get into the advice and the tips, I think we need to sort of understand the subject, why it matters. So in the best way you can, what does a good quality night's sleep do for the body and brain? Well, it affects everything. It affects things short term, immediately, like the next day. If you have a poor night's sleep the night before, you your immunity is immediately impacted, your decision making, just so many aspects of your mood and ability to function. But long term, there are huge health impacts as well. Uh, if you continually over long periods of time have poor sleep, then that affects things such as um, higher risk of having um, depression, anxiety, obesity, diabetes, certain types of cancer, dementia, as well as heart disease. So sleep is something that is free and it's just so good for you, then why not prioritize it really? Yeah, one of the things I loved about the book is very accessible for a start. I think, you know, you don't need any prior knowledge in the subject to understand what's, what's being said. I think that's fantastic. Uh, when I first got onto the, the, the topic of sleep, the first book I read was uh, Why We Sleep by Dr. Matthew Walker. Um, I do really love that book, but it, it can be quite information dense and heavy if you're not a doctor like myself and like most people listening now. Um, so if you can, could you talk us through the sleep cycle and what each stage looks like? Because I thought you did a fantastic job of it in the book. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so um, it's really important, I think, for people to understand that when you fall asleep, your brain doesn't just switch off. It goes through a whole host of amazing processes which give you all the benefits that I just talked about. So you have these things called sleep cycles, which means that about every hour and a half-ish, you go into a light sleep and then a deep sleep and then a dreaming sleep. And then it starts again in cycles across the night. And those different parts of sleep have different uses. They have different uh, functions. So deep sleep, for example, is that sleep where you feel really, really deeply asleep. You're really far from consciousness. So you're, when you're conscious, you're very, you know, you're awake and dreaming sleep is very close to consciousness. So if you look at a dreaming brain, it looks almost identical to an awake brain, but deep sleep is the opposite. When you're deeply asleep, your brain looks completely different. And that's where your body does things like physically repair itself you um if you've been doing lots of exercise you'll have more deep sleep because your body is repairing itself and dreaming sleep is where you sort of process emotion so if you're going through a difficult time like maybe there's a global pandemic and you can't leave your house you know that kind of thing then you'll be processing those emotions and that that situation in your dreaming sleep which means that those dreams are likely to be quite big quite bold quite vivid and potentially too big for you to sort of stay in dreaming sleep and you'll wake up. So the different types of sleep at the beginning of the night, in each sort of hour and a half-ish, you tend to have more deep sleep relative to dreaming sleep. And as the night progresses, you get less and less deep sleep and more and more dreaming sleep. And that's why if you wake up at one in the morning, for example, you probably won't remember dreaming. But if you wake up at five, six, seven in the morning, you're much more likely to remember dreaming because you're much more likely to have caught yourself in dreaming sleep as you woke up. Do you want me to talk more about sleep cycles? I could talk to you about them forever. Oh, I love <laughs> it. So the full length of a, a full sleep cycle, is that 90 minutes, I, I remember you saying? Yeah, about um, 90 minutes to 110. So about, about an hour and a half. And then the next one will start again. And it's really important to know that in between each sleep cycle, everyone wakes up. So you do, I do, everybody wakes up about four or five times at least every night between these sleep cycles. But unless you're awake for at least two minutes, you probably won't remember waking up the next morning. So generally when we're younger, when you're 20, you sleep through the night and you have these awakenings, but they're so short you don't remember them. 
and you think you slept in one solid block. But then when we get older, our awakenings start to get a little bit longer and long enough so that you realize you've woken up and you remember it the next day. And that's really important because as people get older, they think or often think, oh, no, my sleep's gone wrong now because I'm waking up and my sleep is now fragmented or disrupted in some way. And when I was 20, I slept through the night without waking and that was good sleep. And now I'm older. I wake up two times a night to go to the loo. And it's terrible sleep, but actually it's not because your sleep was always fragmented. It was always in these sort of 90 minute, 110 minute blocks. You just didn't realize it. So that's a really common issue. People, as soon as you're worrying about your sleep, you're more likely to give yourself an actual sleeping problem because you're so stressed about the fact that you're not sleeping well, that you start to not sleep well. It's a vicious sort of catch 22, vicious cycle. Yeah, I was going to say, because I've, before I got into this topic, I always used to worry that because I was waking up a few times throughout the night, that meant I was disrupting my sleep pattern. But we should probably be trying to get away from this narrative that focusing on the amount of times we wake up in the night. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And you know, one of the worst things is if you've got those sort of sleep tracker, like, you know, watches, yeah. Fitbits, Apple watches, that kind of thing, because they'll tell you, oh, you woke up three times last night and you might think, oh, no, that's bad. You know, my sleep's bad quality. But just because but it just tells you information that you wouldn't otherwise have known. Sometimes more information is not actually helpful because then you start to worry about something that actually is quite normal. Unless you know that it's normal, you might think or, or like um, Fitbits and things that tell you how much deep sleep you've had or how much dreaming sleep, that kind of thing. And that's another really hot topic that people ask me about. They say, can you help me? My Fitbit or other trackers are available, obviously. Uh, my my sleep tracker told me that I'm getting 25% deep sleep. Can you please help me to get the full night of deep sleep? Because I need to get, you know, all good quality deep sleep the whole night. And I say, no, 25% deep sleep is the most possible amount of deep sleep anyone could have, basically. That's amazing. I'm 40 plus. Uh, I get a lot less than that, almost certainly, because as we age, we get less and less deep sleep. So if, if you're getting 25% deep sleep, that's great. So, but if you didn't know that and you thought that deep sleep meant good sleep, which you kind of, you know, you think, oh, deep sleep is good, so therefore light sleep is bad. But actually, that's not true. You need light sleep and deep sleep and dreaming sleep to be healthy. And if you didn't have all of those three, you wouldn't be healthy. Yeah. So in regard to those um, sleep trackers there, you mentioned, I know you mentioned them a lot in the book, but it's not so much them being a, a bad thing, but it's, it's more people understanding what the information on them actually means. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Because if you are told information and you don't understand whether that's good, normal or bad, then you can you know, quite understandably start stressing about it. And obviously they're getting better at knowing the difference but in reality the only way to really know if you're in deep sleep light sleep or dreaming sleep is by polysomnography which is where you stick electrodes on someone's head because at the end of the day your brain isn't in your wrist you know your wrist can't tell you what's going on in your brain really it can make a really good guess that's what they do they look at your heart rate and your ekg all that kind of thing and they make a, a decent guess at it but it is still a guess yeah yeah so in regards to sleep trackers you know, a good estimate, a good ballpark figure, but don't put, you know, don't take the information as black and white and gospel. Absolutely. Definitely, Love definitely. It. Great. You mentioned the sleep cycle there. And one thing that fascinated me, um, and I wonder if you could talk a bit on it, is we talked about the narrative of waking up a few times in the night and, and correlating that to your, the quality of your sleep. Another big one is when we wake up in the morning and we, and we feel groggy or you get that sort of you wake up and you feel like you've been hit by a bus and you automatically think, oh, I must have had the worst night's sleep ever. But you talk about that that might not be related to the quality of sleep. That might just be to what time in the cycle you woke up. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, I've said about sleep cycles, you go light sleep, deep sleep, and then dreaming sleep. So say in the first 90 minutes-ish sleep of the night, you're going to light sleep, then deep sleep, and then dreaming sleep. So if I woke you up, you know, you're asleep and I came in and I woke you up after an hour of sleep, you'd most likely be in deep sleep. If I woke you up from deep sleep, A, I would have to really wake you up because you were so deeply asleep, you'd be hard to wake up. So I really shake you and I wake you up and you would feel horrible. You would feel just groggy, disorientated. You might even know where you are. You'd be like, what on earth is Dr. Browning doing in my bedroom for a start? But uh, you'd, you'd be really confused. 
if I woke you up instead of after an hour, I woke you up after, say, an hour and a half of sleep, I'd probably be waking you up from dreaming sleep or very light sleep. And at that point, you'd be much easier to wake up because you're much closer to being awake anyway. Your brain is much closer to a conscious brain and you're not as deeply asleep. So you're easier to wake up. I'd wake you up and you'd feel, well, what is Dr. Brand in my room? That's weird. But you'd be quite alert and awake and you might look at your watch and think, wow, I've only had an hour and a half sleep. That hour and a half must have been brilliant quality because I feel great. And that is utterly nonsense. It's just that you've woken up from uh, nearer to consciousness, from a lighter point of awakening. And those cycles continue throughout the night. So if you wake up at seven in the morning to your alarm, you might be waking up from light sleep, in which case you'll wake up feeling quite refreshed and awake. But if you woke up from a deeper sleep, then you would feel more groggy because deeper sleep, it has more sleep inertia. Your sleep wants to pull you back into staying being asleep. So you'll, you'll interpret that as feeling sleepy, groggy, and you might think, oh, that means my night's sleep was rubbish. But actually it's much more likely that it's telling you where you are in that sleep cycle at that moment. So when someone comes to see me with um, sleep issues, I tell them, don't rate how you think you slept last night based on how you feel the second you wake up, because all that's telling you is where you are in the sleep cycle. So get up, have a cup of tea, piece of toast, and about 15, 20 minutes later, then think, okay, how refreshed do I feel now? Because that will be a much more reliable gauge of how well you actually slept than how you feel the second you woke up. A very uh, famous figure that um, Dr. Matthew Walker always gives is that if you took everyone on, on earth that can fully function on less than six hours of sleep or less a night, then that percentage would be less than the 1%. Um, yeah. And there are people, of course, who can function better than others, but ultimately we know it's not a black and white answer and one size fits all, but how do we know how much we need individually? What is a good way to gauge that? Well, generally speaking, the guidelines for a, a working age adult, so 18 to 64, would be that you should be getting between seven and nine hours sleep a night. Okay. Now, if you are a seven hours a night kind of person, then if you tried to get nine hours sleep, that would be impossible almost. But if you were a nine hours of sleep person and you were only getting seven, you would, even though you're within that window, for you, you're not getting enough sleep. Mm -hmm. So you would be feeling, you know, not refreshed, you'd feel fatigued, you would feel like you needed more sleep. So generally speaking, if you wake up in the morning and you haven't really struggled to fall asleep, but you've given yourself a, a decent amount of time and you wake up feeling refreshed, then you've probably had enough sleep, especially if you're within that sort of seven to nine hour window round about that zone. If you are much lower than that or much higher than that, then I would want to question, well, what's going on there? Because you know, there's some flags going on there. And you might be, like you said, there are certain people with the genetic condition whereby short sleepers, <clears throat> whereby they don't need that much sleep, but those people are very rare. And you, know, you can function and get by on less than six hours sleep, but you're not thriving. And there is a sacrifice you're making, whether you realize it or not, to your, uh, your ability to decision-making, your health, that there is a price to pay for deliberately getting less sleep night after night because you're not prioritizing it. Is there such a thing as having too much sleep? Well, the science shows, hence the sleep needs on paper, statistically are between seven and nine hours. Yeah. But if you get significantly more than nine hours sleep a night, that's associated with health risks, just like getting less than seven. Mm. So if you are, that's why I said, if you're wildly outside that zone, if you're getting much less than seven or much more than nine, something's going on there. So there are a couple of reasons why you might be getting a lot more than nine. One of which is a thing called sleep apnea, which is where you stop breathing during the night. And that's an incredibly underdiagnosed illness. And it's uh, where your airway closes up during the night repeatedly. And when your airway closes, it's really common in snorers, they'll be snoring and they'll stop snoring. And that's their airway closing completely. So they're not getting any oxygen. And after about a minute, your brain goes, oh dear, we're not getting any oxygen. We better wake up. It sends a surge of adrenaline to wake you up. You go, oh, take a big breath of air, go back to sleep again. And the cycle continues. And this can happen hundreds of times a night. And what that means is even though you won't remember waking up probably, because remember I said you have to be awake for at least two minutes to remember being awake. So these awakenings are really short. 
So you could easily wake up a hundred times in the night, but not realize at all. But the trouble is your sleep has been completely disrupted because yes, waking up in between those sleep cycles is perfectly normal. Waking up within the sleep cycles is not. So if you're waking up every, you know, two to five minutes throughout the night, you're not getting those lovely waves of sleep that we need. So therefore, after nine hours sleep, you'll still feel exhausted because you haven't actually slept enough. So people with sleep apnea could sleep 10 hours and still have a two hour nap at lunchtime. And I see lots of you know, people with insomnia whose partners they end up saying, well, actually, I think your partner might have a sleep problem because that sounds like sleep apnea to me. So that is not a good thing. Um, another reason you might be sleeping more is because you're ill. Maybe you've got cancer or some kind of illness which you produce your immune system when you're asleep. So you'll be sleeping more if you're trying to get better, if your body is healing. So therefore, it's it's not a clear cut, but you know whether sleeping too much causes you to be ill or whether illness causes you to sleep too much. But the data shows that sleeping too much is associated with not good health outcomes. I want to make sure we define everything as we go along because I don't want to jump over any topics that people might not understand what we're talking about. Before we get into it, could you describe what a circadian rhythm is to those who don't know? Sure. So that is your internal 24-hour clock. And it's something that you probably, you might not even have thought about until you, hopefully we can do this again soon, uh, go to Asia or go to America, you go to another time zone. And when you are lucky enough to be in another time zone, you realize that your body is wanting you to go to sleep when the country you're in is waking up. And it can be very difficult to go to sleep when your body is in UK time. That's your circadian clock. And it's very difficult to move it just like that, as if you've ever experienced jet lag, you would know. And if, even if you haven't experienced jet lag, twice a year, we get a little sneak peek of it when the clocks change, they go forwards or they go back. And just think about how hard it is when the clocks change just by an hour. So your circadian rhythm is basically your internal clock telling you what time it is. And it's mainly controlled by or gets its signal by from the sun. So when we were cavemen back in the day, we didn't have Fitbits and Apple Watches and all that malarkey. We just had the sun. And the sun is always brightest in the sky at midday. Whether it's summer or winter, the most lux, the most light from the sun is always at midday because that's when the sun is nearest us. So if we were just left to nature, we would see the brightest amount of light of the day would always be at midday. So our circadian rhythm is designed to measure our eyes are designed to measure light levels throughout the day and when we see the most light of the day our, our brains go ah right this must be midday I know what time it is right now it's the middle of the day we need to be really awake and alert and we need to produce melatonin about eight to ten hours from now because that means it's going to be nighttime then and that's how it's supposed to work and that's brilliant but it can go wrong so it can go wrong if just like we're experiencing the coronavirus we're at home and we're not leaving the house if you just are inside and you don't get outside to see the sunshine, even though you haven't got a jet lag, your circadian rhythm hasn't shifted wildly, it's not as pronounced, it's not as big, it's not, you're not as awake during the day and asleep at night because you're not getting those signals from the sun to remind your body when daytime is and when nighttime is. And that's why you might have heard of a thing called blue light, which is quite a sort of topical thing. Blue light is that frequency of light that we're looking for. Uh, that our eyes are looking for to, to know what time it is and unfortunately in modern day society we have things called iPhones, uh, laptops, monitors that flood us with blue light which then is telling if we're doing work like you know you and I are on this this, um, this podcast at half past seven at night I've got lots of light coming into me and if I hadn't put my blue light filter on my computer my eyes would be being flooded with bright light and thinking, oh, goodness, I thought it was the evening, but we must be wrong because look at all this bright light. It must be the middle of the day. Let's stop producing melatonin. Let's wake ourselves up. So it's really important that we get outside, get sunshine in the day, especially in the morning, lunchtime, get lots of bright sunshine to help our circadian rhythm know it's daytime. And that will also then help us naturally produce melatonin at night, which will help us be sleepy. And 
That's why dimming the lights in the evening is helpful, putting night shift mode on any electronics that you use, which will automatically take out that blue light. That's also a really useful thing and something that I do on my devices. Yeah, I can, I can testify to this because in October, November, December time, I was working as a COVID-19 tester. And these were like the 12 hour shifts. Okay, so you get in there, at, I was getting there about half a seven in the morning. And I wasn't getting out of there until about half a seven, at eight o'clock at night. But I was getting into the building. It was pitch black when I got in there because it's the middle of winter. I'm from the South Wales Valley. So, it was, you know, the weather's not the best year anyway. So I was getting in in the morning. It was pitch black. And by the time my shift finished and I went outside again, it was pitch black again. And I did, I think I did about 16 days of that on the road. And I just, I didn't see any sun and even though I was doing these big 12-hour shifts, I was getting home at night and I was maybe checking my phone for the first time or, you know, finally seeing a bit of light. And I just I couldn't get to sleep. My sleep was thrown and I had to start trying to figure out new things. So I was investing in um, anti-blue light glasses and trying out all these things. So, yeah, it is fascinating. So can your body not tell the difference between real light and artificial light? It's the particular frequency. So, okay. um, like... You, well, you can't see, but over, over, over my head right now is my normal light for this room. Now it's just a normal bulb, it's not an LED bulb, so therefore that frequency of light isn't the right kind of light that my eyes are looking for, so that's fine. But like iPhones, um, computers, LED devices, they just they have this particular frequency. It's like your eyes when they're trying to tell what time it is. They're not looking at all light, they're mainly looking at specific frequencies. So if you're you're flooding your eyes with these, hence the blue light goggles. If you cut those out, those frequencies, then um, that really helps. But it does take cues from general light as well, but it's really influenced, especially by things like, like the blue light frequency. So it's just worth being careful and, and putting night mode on devices if you're going to use them when your body thinks, when you want it to be night. Mm, yeah, one a really big topic at the moment, I think everyone's in the health space is big on is, um, is Alzheimer's, dementia. We get a lot of questions about it when we speak to any uh, health professional from, from any specific field. I wonder if you could tell us, is there a link that we know of between sleep deprivation and Alzheimer's dementia? Yeah, definitely. So there's the most amazing, fascinating study that you can see that was um, uh, in November. Was it just this November, just gone, or the November before? Oh, I can't remember. But anyway, it was within the last year or within the last year or two, an absolute maximum. And um, this neuroimaging study, so they were looking at people's brains with um, neuroimaging so they could see inside your brain, inside your head. And they looked at people's brains while they slept. And what they saw was something that they had predicted based on evidence, but they hadn't seen it in reality. So what they predicted is that Alzheimer's is obviously dementia in the brain, and it's linked to uh, a thing called amyloid plaques. Now these are sticky substances, these amyloid plaques, that sticky sort of substances that, that build up in your brain and they kind of clog your brain up. And what happens is when you don't sleep enough, you get more and more of these amyloid plaques clogging up your brain. So what happens when you're asleep is that you have this thing called cerebrospinal fluid, which is a uh, fluid in your spine. And then when you sleep, you're channels open up to your brain and this cerebrospinal fluid physically washes over your brain and physically washes away the amyloid plaques. Okay. It literally spring cleans your brain. And they saw this in the imaging studies. It's incredible, it really is. Now, what I think is really important about the link of, of lack of sleep and Alzheimer's is that if you have one or two nights of poor sleep or a, or a a short period of poor sleep, like maybe you've had a baby and the baby is clearly not gonna sleep through the night from day one. So most new parents on the planet have had periods of time with poor sleep. Now, if, if, you, if I'm stressed or if you're stressed and busy, probably you're not gonna prioritize cleaning your bathroom. I certainly don't when I'm busy. I mean, I love a clean bathroom, but if I'm busy, busy, busy with work, that's something that has to just, I have to let that slide. Knowing that when I get less busy, I'll, I can get, get to that. Now, a week of doing that, that's okay. Two weeks, that's nah, not great. A month, getting a bit icky now. What about six months of not cleaning my bathroom? Now it's really disgusting, or a year. That is a little bit like the buildup of amyloid plaques. 
if you have a few nights or a short period of poor sleep, yeah, they start to build up, but then you can help with the you know, cerebral spinal fluid will wash things away. If you have poor sleep for long periods of time, that's when the damage really starts to build up and you get a situation where you can't really get it clean again. You can't get that health benefit back. So I, what I mean is I don't want people to worry about, you know, oh, oh goodness, I had a couple of weeks of poor sleep. I'm definitely going to get Alzheimer's because it's not that cut and dry. You don't have to worry about it like that, but just prioritize it. Yes, your sleep is important. And if you can make sure that you're putting effort in to make sure that you allow yourself to have good sleep because that's good for your health, then that's important. But stressing over it is going to make things worse. So please don't stress over sleep. One thing I'd, I'd love to talk about as well is um, example of myself. When I was in university and I had a exam the next day, I'm, I'm a really anxious person. So I was terrible at falling asleep. So I ended up, much to my detriment, I imagine, I ended up pulling all nighters where I would just revise all night and think I'll just keep revising until the moment I go in and then I go in on no sleep. And I do this a few times. And then after my university career, I started thinking to myself, you know, I, I've probably done myself a bit of damage there. And then you instantly think, right, I need to try and catch up on all this sleep. But then one of the things that I remember hearing Matthew Walker talk about, he, he said that sleep isn't like the bank. You can't just catch up and accumulate sleep and then withdraw it when you need it. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. There's there's a limited amount of sort of making up for sleep loss that you can do, but not really. It doesn't work like that. Yeah, absolutely. A little bit like food, you know, you couldn't eat loads of food two days a week and then starve yourself for four days a week. I mean, it just, you know, that that wouldn't work because you wouldn't function properly on those days when you're starving yourself. So sleep is a is something that you have to regularly do just like food in a reasonable amount of time. On the subject of food there, I'd love to know, is there a correlation at all between sleep or sleep deprivation and weight loss? Yeah, definitely. So these two hormones, ghrelin and leptin, which are your hunger regulating hormones. And when you don't get enough sleep, then you produce too much hormone that makes you, makes you extra hungry. So you start to eat more food. And also, you don't produce enough of the hormone that makes you feel satiated. So when you do eat, you don't feel full. So when you don't sleep enough, you're much more likely to choose poor food choices, like you know, health-wise. You're much more likely to choose fatty, sugary snacks. Whereas if you slept well, you're, you're more likely to, to pick an apple, for example. And the studies show that people who are not sleeping enough eat, on average, an extra 300 calories a day, which may or may not sound a lot, but actually... An extra 300 calories every day, it really adds up. And that's why lack of sleep is absolutely associated with obesity and diabetes. So the worst thing that people can do, in my opinion, as a sleep specialist, is to get up an hour or two early to go to the gym before work. Because at, at, the, sacrifice, at the expense of sleep, if you are giving yourself only five hours sleep, you, know, you need seven hours, but rather than have seven hours sleep, you think, no, I'll go to the gym, be healthy. I'll have five hours sleep and go to the gym. You're just robbing Peter to pay Paul because yes, going to the gym is great. I mean, I love exercise. I love being healthy, but not at the expense of sleep. That's, that's terrible. So find a way of adding exercise into your life. Like take it from your Netflix time. Don't take it from your sleep. That would be my my advice. And I hear this all the time and it makes me just like, oh, please don't do that. Don't, you know, don't sacrifice. Getting up early is great as long as you're going to bed early enough to get a full night's sleep. Don't just sacrifice sleep for, for that. Love it. We mentioned um, diet there and that's, a, that's something I'd love to talk about is food is I was always bad for this. Um, I, I tried to be um, conscious of it. I'm still not the best, but what do we know about food and drink before bed and how that affects your ability to fall asleep? Yeah, so it's a little bit of complicated relationship, but if you have a massive meal right before bed or you have something particularly fatty or spicy, then you're going to have a bit of indigestion. That's not going to be great for you. You're going to have digestive issues. It'll be uncomfortable. But if you go to bed hungry, then you're going to struggle to sleep because as humans, again, talking back to when we were cavemen, when we are hungry, we're not relaxed. Now, when we're hungry, we are deliberately designed to be uncomfortable and a bit anxious because 
we need to go and hunt. We need to go and hunt for food or forage for berries. If we're hungry, we need to be motivated to do something about it. If we weren't motivated to do anything about it, we'd all just sit in a cave and think, I can't be bothered to go and hunt, I'll just lie here. And then everyone would just die of starvation. So if you're going to bed hungry, your body is telling you, oh, we should go to the fridge. It's not telling you to go and hunt because we've got a fridge. So tell you, oh, go up and go and do something about that. Or you might be okay when you fall asleep, but you might wake up at three or four in the morning and be hungry. And you do not want to be eating at three or four in the morning because your circadian rhythm, remember that 24 hour clock, it's mainly regulated by sunshine, but it's also regulated by mealtimes to a lesser extent. And if you start eating at three, four in the morning, then your, your circadian rhythm will think that's morning and it will start to wake you up at three, four in the morning regularly to say, hey, it's this morning, let's get up and have breakfast. So don't do that. So what I would suggest is look at having something just before bed. Just think about when we have kids, we give them milk and a cookie before bed. And then as we grow up and we become adults, we just throw that out the window and we don't do that anymore but actually if you think about the kind of behaviors that you that you give you do for your children your babies when they're young we do the perfect thing for good night's sleep but then as adults we just like i said we just chuck that right out the window so having something just before bed that is a, a small snack not a big meal at all not even a breakfast size but smaller than that a little snack portion of like a brown bread turkey sandwich would be great just one slice of bread in half turkey sandwich or a small bowl of porridge with a bit of kiwi on top because kiwi has been associated with every bed of sleep something like that will just give you slow release carbohydrate energy so your body takes a while to digest it it will give you slow release energy across the night which will then help you to stay go to sleep quicker and stay asleep feeling more satisfied so and and drinking is the same you know i lots of people think that needing the loo wakes them up in the middle of the night especially as we get older but remember as i said as we get older these awakenings that we've always had get a bit longer and long enough so we realize that we're having them so a lot of times people think that it's needing the toilet that their bladder has gone wrong when they're old or older you know I, again i put myself in this bracket um but your bladder often isn't the cause of your awakening it's just that you've woken up enough to realize that you need the toilet because during the daytime you go to the loo probably every two to three hours. So therefore, if you've been asleep for two to three hours, your bladder's probably filled up a little bit. And then if you're awake enough to realise that you're awake, you'll just be like, oh, my bladder's a bit full. Just go to the loo and come back to bed again, go back to sleep. If you don't drink anything, and I see so many people who, who don't drink a thing after 6pm because they don't want to wake up in the night. But actually, then they're just waking up thirsty. You're, you're, you're more likely to to cause yourself to wake up because you're just parched. So yes, do not have a pint of water right before you go to sleep. That's crazy because then you'll have a really full bladder, but just have normal amounts of water through the evening to keep you hydrated so that you're hydrated enough to sleep well and that will see you through the night. And if you do wake up and need the loo, go to the loo, come back, don't worry about it. That's normal. Don't obsess about trying to stop that awakening because it's, it's a bit like obsessing about stopping the wrinkles or stopping your hair going grey. It's just part of life and we just need to just work with it, really. Just embrace it. It's just a change and that's fine. Again, I'm highlighting all my bad habits here, but it's always been a thing for me where I, I've always been a big dr a tea and coffee drinker, always have since I was young. My parents tell me I, I generally used to drink tea out of a baby bottle when I was when I was a baby. I've, I've loved it all my life. I've loved it all my life. And I got to the point where I, I had always had problems falling asleep. But people would say to me, maybe it's the tea and coffee you're drinking all day long. And I always said back, oh, no, it's, I have a really high caffeine tolerance. It's fine. It doesn't affect me. But now when I'm a little bit more conscious of it, it probably had a massive part to play. What advice would you give on the relationship between someone who, you know, wants to start falling asleep earlier, falling asleep a bit easier and their caffeine intake? Is it a case to switch into maybe decaf in the evenings? Yeah, definitely. So yeah, in, in reality, when I first started, you know, when I graduated from my insomnia degree in 2006, decaf teas and coffees were pretty gross, to be fair. But now, honestly, they're actually really nice. Yeah. So just just swap them just swap them out the decaf options are you won't even notice i'm sure so um caffeine 
has a six hour half life. That means six hours after you've had that cup of tea or coffee or Coke or chocolate, half the caffeine is still in your system. And that's a really long time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you think, well, I, I don't drink any caffeine after 6 p.m., but in reality, if you've had a cup of coffee at five, then at 10, 11 o'clock, half that caffeine is still in your system. Mm -hmm. And how caffeine affects sleep is it stops your brain from being able to realize how tired you are, which is really, really useful for lorry drivers, for uh, when you need to stay awake and stay alert, because caffeine is your friend, because you, you pull over at the, if you're feeling, you know, you feel like, oh, I'm feeling a bit tired, pull over, go into a, um, you know, a, a service station, grab a double, double espresso or a, a large coffee, go back to your car, down the coffee, lie down or just lie back in the seat, have a 15 minute nap in the car. By the time you wake up, that caffeine starts to hit your system and you'll be more alert and you've had tiny naps, you'll feel more refreshed and you can carry on driving. But the trouble is if you were an hour from home, by the time you get home, that caffeine doesn't realize you don't need it anymore. It's still mm. there. So you'll make it home, lie down and you'll be wide awake in bed because that caffeine is still in your system, still fooling your body into thinking that you don't need sleep. So yeah, generally speaking, if you're struggling to fall asleep, just play about with you know, avoiding caffeine earlier and earlier and see how it affects you, see if it helps. And if it doesn't, then you, know, you don't have, no one has to be doing anything if the sleep isn't broken. But if you're struggling, then absolutely, I would say, you know, maybe, maybe switch to decaf after lunchtime, two o'clock, something like that. That would be my advice. One thing I'd love to get your take on is this whole nap or no nap debate. Now, I, I, a few years ago, I listened to an interview with um, the NBA superstar LeBron James, and he mm -hmm. talked about how he would he naps every day. He like he'd go for his basketball practice, he'd come home and he'd have a two hour nap, and that's part of his, you know, his, his peak performance mindset. Is there any you know truth in that being a factor in his performance? Do you think? And what advice would you give to people who don't know whether napping in the day is the right option or the wrong option? Definitely. <clears throat> There's a lot of scientific uh, evidence to suggest that naps are, are great. They, they increase your productivity. They, they increase your alertness. They're, they're brilliant, but they have to be done exactly as you said, at the right time in the right circumstances. Now, you have this um, thing called your sleep drive, your, your body's ability to know how tired you are. If you're struggling to sleep at night, if your mind is racing or maybe you've had too much caffeine or you've got an exam the next day, you know, and you're unable to sleep well at night, having a nap during the day to make up for that sleep isn't a great plan because you're just, you're topping yourself up with a nap sleep and you're not really then going to be hungry enough for sleep the next night. If you are getting enough sleep at night, or maybe you're not getting enough, but you're not struggling to sleep. Maybe you're not getting enough sleep because a baby's waking up throughout the night, or you, you just had to go to uh, bed late because you're working really hard and you didn't get enough sleep, but not because you couldn't sleep, just because life didn't let you sleep. In those situations, <clears throat> a catch-up nap is a great plan. And um, in fairness, in reality, if businesses would allow people to have a you know, post-lunch 20-minute power nap, that would really boost uh, productivity at work and it would be great and it's very common in Japan people are there's a I forgot what the word is but it, I, wrote, I wrote an article about naps recently but in Japan there's a, a special word for it that a special word that means lunchtime nap and it's a uh, quite popular to help people be peak performance if you are going to have a, a lunchtime nap then like I said 20 minutes is kind of a great time an hour would be terrible and that's exactly because remember earlier I said about those sleep cycles and that the sleep cycle is about an hour and a half. And if I woke you up after an hour, you'd be in deep sleep and you would feel horrible. And that's why a nap for an hour is not a good plan because you'll have, you'll go from light sleep into that deep sleep and then you'll wake up from that nap and you'll be in that deep sleep and feel groggy and you'll have sleep inertia and you'll just feel awful. So 20 minute nap means you'll stay in that light sleep. You'll get some refreshment from the nap, but without going into the deep sleep and feeling groggy or you could have a longer nap, like an hour and a half to you know two-ish hours, like a, a good sleep cycle, like the LeBron James example. That would give you like a full sleep cycle and you'd feel really refreshed. 
Mm. So yeah, naps Amazing. are good and not good, but it depends on you know, your sleep. You Love it. The one of the last questions I want to touch on before we move into our our, our final uh, few quick fire questions is you talk about the importance of a good bedroom environment. Now, what tips could you give the people listening right now? Some quick fire bedroom environment enhancing tips. Sure. Well, at the moment with the coronavirus, lots of people are having to work in their bedrooms. And in an ideal world, that's not great because you want your bedroom to be a place just for sleep, sleep and sex, but nothing else. But unfortunately, you know, most of us aren't multimillionaires with countless offices for every single person in your family. So if <clears throat> your uh, bedroom does have to be the office as well, then just try to make sure that you're not working in the bed itself. Maybe have a desk where you can work. And then when it's nighttime, take the, the clutter away. Because if you've got piles of laundry to put away, if you've got pictures that haven't been hung on the walls, if you've got your office paperwork and your laptop on your desk, when you're in bed, you won't feel relaxed and like you can really switch off because you can see all of these jobs you haven't done yet. So, or like an exercise machine, if you have that in your bedroom, I mean, exercise is great, but if you haven't done any exercise that day and you're lying down to sleep, your brain's going, oh, you failed again today. You didn't go on the exercise bike, did you? And then you'll just feel more stressed. So keeping your bedroom ideally as a kind of really relaxing haven for sleep is really good. And making sure that you've got a comfortable mattress that suits you. And depending on your sleeping style, um, your mattress really shouldn't be more than about seven, eight years old. And lots of us have mattresses that are wildly too old. And if they are, it is really quite disgusting to appreciate how much of your dead skin and sweat is in that mattress. It's just yucky. So please do look at replacing your mattress regularly um, and getting the right kind of pillows and duvet. If you have um, you know, natural fibres, the, the air can flow much more and you'll keep cooler in the night, which is important. Um, yeah, dark curtains so that the, you don't get woken up with bright sunshine in the summer. But it doesn't have to be blackout blinds because if it's blackout, then you can get used to perfection. Whereas you know, if it's dark enough, that's probably good enough. And, and with um, things like in your bedroom, like TVs, that kind of thing, in an ideal world, like I said, you shouldn't be doing other things in your bedroom other than sleep and sex. So you're know, watching TV in your bedroom isn't really ideal. So maybe don't have a TV in your bedroom, but if you do and your sleep is fine, then then go for it. Personally, I'm a great sleeper and I do have a TV in my bedroom. If I started to sleep poorly, then I would change that. Do you see what I mean? But if you are a good sleeper, you don't have to follow any rules. You can just, you, know, you can have a bedroom covered in clutter if you sleep fine. I mean, you don't have to tidy it up. But if you're struggling with sleep, then you might want to think, okay, maybe, you know, my work paperwork and those pictures not on the wall and the lack of curtains might be a bit of a cause. Amazing. We've talked a lot about your book today. Um, so one of our questions we ask every guest are books that have impacted your life up to this point. So when I think of sleep, I think of books like I mentioned, Matthew Walker, Why We Sleep. Um, a few former guests of the show, there's uh, Sleep Smarter by Sean uh, Stevenson. There's Nick Littlehills has a, a lot of good work. Are there any books that have impacted you and your career that you could recommend other than your own? Yeah, definitely. So um, Jason, Professor Jason Ellis and um, Colin Espy, they are, there's two separate books. So they are CBTI specialists. So CBTI is Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Insomnia. And that is the NICE guideline treatment, recommended treatment for, for chronic insomnia, for really bad sleep. So the, my book that I've written is much more of a sort of a lighter, general how to help if your sleep's going a bit, a bit wrong. Um, but if you're sleep is properly broken, then a more severe intervention would be necessary. And those two books are, um, are, are brilliant. And, you know, and Colin Espy is a, uh, a pioneer in the field and, and Jason Ellis is, uh, he's based um, in the UK and he's just a, a wonderful man as well as a great sort of sleep pioneer. So those two sleep books I would highly recommend. Fantastic. The last question I have for you that we ask every guest. So I'll give you an example of myself. For me at the moment, what makes my life worth living? Having conversations like these with yourself, putting them out there and just knowing that it's going to you know, help someone. It's going to impact someone's life. But for you right now, for Dr. Lindsay Browning, what makes a life worth living? Well, 
genuinely I love my job I absolutely love helping people you know I, I help people all the time over the phone for free because they don't need to you know come and see me they just phone me up and I give them some tips and I love that um but apart from my work then I would say yeah and obviously the cliche but my, my family love them very much and my very amazing cute dog who's in that next room but I won't drag her in here uh, and food I just love food and if I didn't love food I would be so skinny uh, but I love food. So I love cooking. I love all sorts of, you know, I love Korean food, Mexican food. I love all food. There isn't a food in the world I don't love. So food. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, we talked about this book, Navigating Sleeplessness. Um, like I said, a fantastic, accessible book. You don't have to have any knowledge on the subject to really get a lot out of it. I highly recommend it. I will put it in the show notes below. But for everyone listening, where can they buy the book first foremost and more check out more from you maybe online and social media definitely so the book is available in all good bookshops so amazon waterstones smiths anywhere like any any book place you'll get it which is amazing um and you can get it in america and in the uk so if you're in america then you can um and with me so all my social media tags are at dr browning sleep so dr browning sleep and i'm on instagram uh, Twitter, Facebook, and you know, I post regularly. And also, I have a newsletter that I give out monthly with lots of sleep tips. And I give, you know, I do lots of events and things. So, if you did want to find out about some, I often give lots of free events so you can listen to me talk about sleep if you're not bored of me already at this stage. Um, and my website is troublesleeping.co.uk. That's troublesleeping.co.uk. Yeah, and I help people, individuals, and companies with, you know, corporate well-being webinars as well as individuals with their with their sleeping problems perfect dr browning thank you so much for joining me today it's been an absolute pleasure thank you so much for having me